Okay, and I think we are live. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Avon Book Fest. Um, it's so great to see so many of you tuning in for our main events, and we have a brilliant panel for you this Friday afternoon. Um, our authors would love to answer your questions today, so please do send through anything you would like to ask in the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, so we have three fabulous authors here to talk to you today, but before I hand over to them, I wanted to quickly let you all know just a little bit about us at Avon. So I'm Beth, Editorial Assistant at Avon, and I head up our open submissions process. So we are a commercial fiction division of HarperCollins, and we are actively on the lookout for new writers. We've in fact just opened up a brand new submissions process, so if you've written a book and think that we might be a good fit, then please do visit our website on avonbooks.co.uk forward slash submissions, and please do follow the submission guidelines. So you don't need a literary agent to submit to us in this way, or need to have any experience of being published before. We're just always after a brilliant story and we can't wait to read your novels. Now, I'm delighted to introduce today's panel. Leading our discussion today, we've got Sunday Times best-selling author Sue Moorcroft, whose latest title, Summer on a Sunny Island, was published yesterday. So congratulations, Sue. Thank you and very much. Perfect summer read, guaranteed to make you smile and whisk you away to Malta from the comfort of your very own home. And Sue will be chatting to two of our lovely women's fiction authors, Bella Osborne and Philippa Ashley. Bella also celebrated publication day yesterday for part three, Meet Me at Pebble Beach. So even more congratulations are in order. If you've read parts one and two of this novel serialization and can't wait to see what happens next with Reagan, then what are you waiting for? Pop it on your Kindle now. And if you're looking forward to reading Reagan's story in its entirety, then not long to wait. The full ebook and paperback publishes on the 28th of May. And Philippa's upcoming summer title, A Perfect Cornish Escape, is the eagerly awaited third book in her Cornish trilogy, and we can't wait to share it with readers in June. You can pre-order today and then look forward to escaping with this heartwarming book in the summer. So without further ado, over to you Sue to kick things off. Thank you very much Beth and welcome to Philippa and to Bella. Bella you seem to be actually on a beach. Um, wouldn't that be lovely? Wouldn't that be lovely? Yeah. <laughs> don't be social distance with either, so it's terrific. I could just yeah. do it myself. It'd be so <laughs> lovely. You seem to have managed that really well, and your um, your new book is Meet Me at Pebble Beach. Yeah, um, it's coming. It comes out digitally first, and the whole thing, which is just one book, comes out on the twenty eighth of May. So we're counting down now. We're just under four weeks. To and will it come out as a paperback then? It will, so it will be ebook, paperback, and audio. Do you want so, to go ahead and introduce yourself as in a more general way? I said, well, it's me. Um, and um, the book that's coming out, just talking about, is my sixth book. Uh, so, I'll, shall I read the blurb? Yes, go on then. The blurb is Regan is holding a winning lottery ticket. Goodbye to the boyfriend who never had her back, and so long to the job she can't stand. <laughs> Except it's a bit too good to be true. When Regan gets pranked, she finds herself jobless, homeless, and single in one fell swoop. Luckily, her friendly seaside community provides a beacon of hope proving to Regan that sometimes you really can rely on the kindness of others, and one local in particular, a handsome fireman called Charlie, um, who helps Regan realise that this could be her chance for a fresh start. Armed with a list of ways to change her life, Regan decides it's time to step out of her comfort zone, because as Charlie knows all too well, life is for living. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, congratulations on publication yesterday. Well, yes, thanks to you. Thank very you very exciting. much. Very exciting. It is, yeah. I never get over it, do you? No, 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 <laughs> brilliant. Usually have more than tea, though. <laughs> I was just going to say, what have you, what have you got in your mug? I've got, I've got black red bush tea in mine. Mine's Lady Grey, black Lady Grey. We're being very posh. Philippa. Hello. Hi. Hiya. Hiya. What, what do you want to tell us about your brand new book, and when exactly is it coming out? Because I, I missed it. The official publication date is June the eleventh. But if I get any more updates to that, I'll be letting the readers know. But officially, it's June the 11th. So not long to wait. No, not at all. <laughs> and what's it called? It's called A Perfect Cornish Escape. And it's the third in the Paul Smello trilogy. Yeah. Which, yeah. Um, they're all set around a fictional village in Cornwall called Paul Smello. So, yeah, this is the, yeah, it's quite... It's quite an exciting and dramatic plot this one so I'm really looking forward to sharing it. Shall I read the blurb? Yeah, <laughs> right yeah okay so 
So we're in Cornwall is the perfect time for a fresh start. Seven years ago, Marina Hudson's husband was lost at sea. She vowed to love him forever, but when kind-hearted Lachlan arrives in Porth Mellow, should she deny herself another chance at happiness? Tiff Trescott was living life to the full as a journalist in London until her boyfriend's betrayal brought it all crashing down. Fleeing to her cousin Marina's cottage, Tiff feels like a fish out of water. And when brooding local Dirk wins a day with her in a charity auction, she's thrown headfirst into Cornish life. So it's about, it's about new beginnings and fresh starts for all the characters. So, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Do you want to show us the cover? You've got it somewhere, haven't you? Uh, bear with me, it's on my phone. So I've, seen it. <coughs> oh, I've, I've got mine to handle. Mm. I'm actually on charge, but um, I think, uh, can you see that? I don't Just a bit higher up, yeah, that's perfect. That's lovely. Yeah, so there's a girl sort of standing on the cliffs. Well, that's Marina, and she's looking out to sea in the lighthouse. So, yeah, wondering, um, thinking about Nate, her husband. But that's it, yeah. I haven't, sadly, I haven't got the paper back yet. But, um, no, a bit early. Soon, I hope. You got yours, Bella? Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, lovely. I love the, um, the background keeps coming up. Sea huts. The, beach what huts. they call beach huts, yeah. Beach huts, yeah. Yeah, is this a good point? There aren't actually any beach huts in it, but it's still it's still very lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same with the summer to remember. Yeah, there's beach huts on the cover, and I thought, shall I write some in? Nah. I did. I added a lighthouse to mine. Did you? Yeah, when I, I saw remember. it, it wasn't it wasn't difficult. To no. Just add a lighthouse in, but I added a lighthouse. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is my new one somewhere on a sunny island that comes out back to front to me does it come out back to front to you no it's fine oh, good yeah. um so that's set in malta and um my beloved malta as i call it because i was brought up there for several years as a kid so um the mum in the book dory uh i've sent myself up a bit she's an army kid who never shuts up about being an army kid and living in malta so um <laughs> i have set i have given her my bad habit there so I'll, I'll read you the blurb. Um, when Rosa Hammond splits up from her partner Marcus, her mum Dory suggests a summer in Malta. Not one to sit back and watch her daughter be unhappy, Dory introduces Rosa to Zach in the hope that romance will bloom under the summer sun. But Rosa's determined not to be swayed by a handsome man. She's in Malta to work after all. Zach, meanwhile, is a magnet for trouble and is dealing with a fair few problems of his own. Neither Rosa nor Zach are ready for love, but does fate have other ideas? And after a summer in paradise, will Rosa ever want to leave? Well, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler for me to tell you I make it all too possible for her to leave. <laughs> because <laughs> why leave a heroine in paradise when you can put her through the tortures of hell instead? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about setting. Um, let's go to you first, Philippa. Um, your book's set in Cornwall, which is real, yeah. but what about... Um, Port Mallow. About the, yeah, Port Mallow. Is it, is it like Doc Martin that it's really Port Isaac or something? Uh, yeah, well, yes, really. It is probably really Port Levin, which um, is on, it's just at the top of the Lizard, really, on the south coast and is, is famous for its these huge waves, which I think they can fling the pebbles up the cliffs and smash people's windows. And, wow. and there's this big double double harbour at Port Levin because the ships shelter in the inner harbour because the outer one's not enough to keep the sea out. So it's a really dramatic setting and there's loads of restaurants and a food festival. I absolutely love it there. So the, that's my... Um, it's kind of that, but obviously, as we all do, we've changed bits to suit our fictional purposes. Do you, do you, do you like change a map or make yourself a note or does it all just stay in your head? It, it stays in my head. I mean, I got the idea when my husband was on a photography course there for three days a few years ago. And I was, I had the car and also I was on my own for three days. And I walked o over every <laughs> inch of it, I think. And um, the food festival was about to be held and the posters were up and that's 
it kind of has become kind of absorbed. Yeah, I've got a photo on my phone of the moment I started jotting down notes. Yeah. The um, there. So now I've yeah just written my third book, and I really just really love setting books there. It really inspires me. Um, but you've you've in the past you've set them in the Silly Isles, so you obviously like that sort of bit off of England oh, and just beyond. I'm right in saying that, aren't I? Yeah, I love the Isles of Scilly. I've done three. I'd like to do some more there. It's it's probably one of the most my favourite places I've ever been in the world. So um, I just love the Isles of Scilly. I'd like. We went last year in June for a week, and then when we can, I'd like to go again. Yeah, yeah. It's all when we can, isn't it? I've yeah. just cancelled my June writing break in Malta. Mm -hmm. Bella, your mm -hmm. Pebble Beach is Brighton, which is one I'm pretty familiar with because my my brother used to live there so that's where I used to go to fall off my mum and dad's radar when I was about 17 and then my son went there to uni so I, I used to then go there to get on his radar <laughs> so why did you choose Brighton and have you have you put fictional bits in? Um, no well yes I have I have actually but um, it's pretty much as is I've just there's a, a coffee shop that doesn't exist that's um, that's a key place in the book but otherwise it's it's all Brighton and um, I just really love Brighton I think we yeah. wanted this to have to be a seaside location and um, it's just the quintessential British town for me it's everything the seaside town should be really it's um, and it's got a really lovely mix it's got the Regency building so it's got all the history there as well as um, lovely beach a pier and I love the West Pier if you obviously you know Sue but the people watching if you, if you There's have not much um, been. there's not much left of it exactly. <laughs> there were two piers in Brighton and the west pier was um, burnt down and storm ravaged and there's just a skeleton now but it's really evocative and I re I'm really quite drawn to it so that that features in the in the book as well it's uh, it, it know, features in in one of mine actually a backlist title and my editor at the time lived in Eastbourne and she said that where my heroine was standing um, on the palace pier she wouldn't be able to see the west pier so um, I texted my son and asked him and he rang me up from the palace pier and said, is she 17 feet tall? I said, no, he said, she can't see it then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, would, I was surprised. I would have thought you probably could see it, but clearly not. It was, you know, the kiosks at the front of the palace pier. She'd gone yeah. in that, that crescent of kiosks right. and that's yeah. why she couldn't see it. No, so no. my editor was right, as editors always are, and I was wrong. Right, I'm going to bring in some audience now. Um, good afternoon to Ellie Pilcher, hiya, and good afternoon to Mick Arnold and Tess Garland and Michelle Russell. I'll start with Michelle Russell's uh, question. It's one to all of us. What are some of the most surprising things you learned in creating your books? Let's start with you this time, Bella. Um surprising things well with this book um i learned about hedgehogs and completely randomly so i did a load of research and um, got in touch with two fabulous teenage girls who run a hedgehog rescue in stratford upon avon so it's called hedgehog friendly town so if you look them up they're on twitter and they've won all sorts of awards and they're fantastic and they were really good at answering my questions and my stupid questions about hedgehogs and were really helpful and then below me after i would um, written and submitted the manuscript we had some work done in our garden. They lifted up a little rotting old shed and underneath was a mummy hedgehog and four babies. Aww. So what are the odds of that? So to cut a long story short, I ended up being a hedgehog rehabilitator because mum disowned them and they ended up going to hedgehog rescue and then they needed to release them. So they said, would you like to have them back? To Hello. Them? So that's what we did. So we, we had them each back one at a time and we um, released that hedgehog into the garden Ooh, um, okay. well I, I can still hear Bella so may, maybe we'll all just come back online in yes, a minute we're back we're back uh, aren't we if it, if it please please just carry on because zoom's really good it just works it all yeah. out for itself um and my my printer just sort of burped it really wasn't me it was yeah. the printer doing that thing it does all yeah. on its own <laughs> <laughs> so, so Philippa was there anything new you'd learn from this book uh one of the one of the things I had to go and research, which was amazing, was um, I, don't, I don't know if you have, any, well, anybody who's been around the coast, if you've ever seen the Coast Watch stations, 
they're like they were run by the Coast Guard and they're always in really wild remote locations for a reason because the, the people in the Coast Watch stations they watch over the ships coming past and people on the coast path and the beaches it's something they do by sight uh, but uh, they were all most I think all of them had to be closed because they couldn't be the Coast Guard couldn't afford to keep them open but hundreds of them are now run by volunteers and um, that's we were we went to one on Cape Cornwall and it was absolutely fascinating they let you look through the binoculars you can see for miles um, they, you know, they save lots of lives because they're actually there constantly keeping a watch on people. And I just suddenly thought of them being called the wave watchers. And that, that's what gave me the idea for this, for uh, a perfect Cornish escape, uh, how this lady had lost a husband and she thinks if my Coast Guard lookout had been open, maybe they would have seen him, maybe they could have oh, seen wow. him. So she... At the beginning of the book, she's grief stricken and thinking that, but but come forward over six years and she's actually reopened that station so that no one else will have to, um, you know, go through what she has and she helps run it. So that was amazing. I recommend it next time you're allowed to go on holiday or if you actually live very close to one, go in and um, when you get the chance again and have a look, it's fantastic. Wow. That makes mine seem very pedestrian because um, I was just shocked. I knew that obviously in, in well, obviously to me in Malta, um, English is an official language, but I tended to think that most people, um, Maltese was at least their first language, but that's not true. And there's a whole sector of the Maltese population who don't speak Maltese. So that I found astonishing. So we've got, um, we've got Phoebe Morgan, who's quite well known to all of us. Um, she's, she's my editor at the moment. Uh, hi Phoebe, and she's an author in her own right, very successful. What advice would you give to an aspiring writer who would like to be published someday? Um, well, I'll go first on this one. Um, I've got very strong opinions on this, is don't stop writing. It's amazing how many people say, well, you know, I ran out of steam, so I stopped, or I had a rejection, so I stopped. I had sent off 30 short stories before I got one accepted to different magazines and my first novel was my eighth novel. So Don't Stop is my big one. Philippa, let's go back to you. Uh, I definitely, well, I echo what you're saying, Sue, because um, that's the moment, we all still find those points in our novel, um, no matter how experienced we are, when we, we feel it might have come to a stop. And that, that's the thing that for me was hardest. It's, it's your structure, that, that's just about structuring your book and then looking at your characters and how they develop. And that is something that all writers when they're producing a novel have to wrestle with. It's not just your fault because you can't write a book or you should give up. It's, it's an absolutely normal part of, of writing. So it's finding the tools and developing them and learning to get you through that sticky point um, that, that will enable you to complete your first novel and make a better job of the one you're working on. So don't give up at any point, because that's normal. I agree. Oh, great. Bella? Um, I'd say try and find like-minded people, whether that's a local writing group or big associations, uh, like the Romantic Novelist Association, which we're all members of. Yeah. There's such value in finding your tribe. And however supportive friends and family are, nobody really knows what it's like um, than another writer. And so it's really important, certainly when times are tough, to have that group of friends that are there to pick you up and um, help you keep going. So I think find, find your tribe and they're great for you know, boosting morale and um, drinking sessions as well. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think that uh, it's really useful to pick up on that. Um, to learn about publishing as well as writing. Um, and when you go, when, when I started going to the RNA, just standing in the queue for lunch or the ladies or something, just hearing what people are saying, um, you think, oh, I didn't know that. I had no idea that publishing worked that way. And it's just, just helpful, I think. So we've got um, Tess Garfield. Hello, Tess. I've recently read Philippa's Penwith trilogy, The Cornish Cafe, and loved the incredible sense of setting. 
I found this inspirational for a novel I'm working on for my MA in creative writing. What research do you do to inspire your settings? And as Bella's run away, would you like to take that Let one? Let the cat well? out, sorry. Uh, what research? I mean, my settings come first. It's just, I have a, quite a strong emotional reaction to places. So unless I've got a setting, I wouldn't even think of starting a novel. The setting's more important than the idea, which might sound bizarre. And I, it's not that I'm specifically thinking when I go to a place. You know, I'm, look, I'm not looking for an idea. It's almost as if a few hours later or I've absorbed the setting and I've seen something like the Coast Watch station. I've yeah, seen yeah. it and then suddenly I'm thinking, what if, what if this happened here or um, what Cornish Cafe, I have to say, was partly inspired by seeing Aidan Turner filming Poldark. <laughs> I have to admit that um, we, we once accidentally happened on the filming of the second Poldark series. Truly, we didn't go specifically to go and see Aidan Turner. We found out he was about half an hour away filming it. So off we rattled in this hired camper van to watch the filming and then that kind of developed into thinking um, of ideas for Cornish Cafe and I haven't been able to stop ever since writing about Cornwall. And, and Bella, are you, are you, do you do loads of research or do you know, know Brighton so well or something? Um, I've been to Brighton a few times but I did go, before I started writing, I went for um, a couple of days just to make sure I got things right in my mind. And then when I was editing, I went again. So I went the first time with the family and we just had a really lovely time and got a feel for the place again. But then when I was editing, I went back and did crazy things like walking around with a map muttering to myself because yeah. where I've got people going in different directions. And I think it's really cheeky, but Brighton Council had done some road works. So where I'd got a road, it had made it pedestrian. So <laughs> it really screwed me. It was rude. I thought it was rude. So I was going around literally with a tourist map, muttering to myself, well, we could come down there and go. People were avoiding me on the pavement before social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that accurate. I'm not. It's all, it, it, it's all in my head. And sometimes I get back to a place and think, it wasn't really like that, but that's just how I must have felt about it at the time. So, yeah. Uh, no, I'm fairly accurate when it's a real place, but I set quite a few of my novels in villages that don't exist they're near real places and then I have big pieces of paper with it all all on and I, I don't um I don't then have to do much research on on that um but like this book being set in Malta although I know it very well um it was an, an amazing excuse to go for four trips last year I must have known the pandemic was coming um because I went four times with three different people and once on my own and actually writing part of the book there and I've done this in Italy as well is such a rewarding experience I'd really recommend it um, I, I just want to write books wherever I actually want to go now thank you very much for your question Tess who else have we got hello 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 people um, anonymous attendee hi <laughs> what tips would you give to someone struggling to think of a good book idea well, Philippa, you started this um, thread in a way, so do you want to refine on it? Struggling for a good book idea. Uh, well, I don't really know how to answer. I wouldn't say I struggle for ideas. Um, I've, it's kind of feast or famine, I find. If you're looking for an idea, when you, then it's, you, you, know, you feel you're straining for it, really. Whereas if you've already, you're already in the middle of another book or you've got two or three books planned, then another three pop up at once. I suppose that's like buses, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know how to answer that because it's they, not they, come. they just come, but they don't, they don't sometimes. I, I think let, if I'm, if, with short stories, I don't have that problem with novels, but I do have it with short stories. I love, I found I love writing short stories, but I'm not very experienced at it. And I get asked for more and more short stories. Now there, especially if I'm deep in a novel, it's quite hard to find the space for a short story. So 
I will look for an idea for that within my world of Porth Mellow. Anything I might not have put in the book or something have been has been at the corner of my mind, then I will pluck that and I will just I will just run with it. Um, but for, for novels, I haven't I'm not really short of ideas. Can I just say though, I think you train your mind as a novelist as you get more experience. I used to work as a local journalist and you were looking at things as stories all the time. And I think the more novels you write and the more you write, the more you will see things in your everyday life as an idea for a novel. I don't know if you find that, Sue. Yeah, I do. Um, I call it my plotty head. Yeah. And it's a bit like a piece of a jigsaw dropping into the correct hole. Yeah. Somebody says something and I know I literally glaze over sometimes and I will sometimes say to someone, can I use that? It won't be recognizable, but can I use that situation? Yeah. Um, and sometimes it is more, um, I have occasionally gone looking for an idea. If I know something isn't meaty enough, like in the Christmas promise, I knew the heroine just not liking Christmas wasn't enough for a novel. It, that might be fine for a short story. Or, or a serial maybe. And so I, um, I did look through current news issues, um, like magazine features, and there was a lot going on about revenge porn and I felt very strongly about it. I'm lucky that I've never been in the situation. Uh, being married to the same guy for 35 years really helps that kind of thing. But um, it's, um, it was something that I just felt so angry on behalf of those, it was mainly women, not all, um, but I decided to give her that issue, an ex-boyfriend who had these saucy photos. And so I just literally looked for a story online in that occasion. But yeah, it can be, it can be pretty dangerous to tell me something interesting. <laughs> and you, Bella? Um, well, I was just checking because I have a, a file that I call Random Thoughts mm. on my <laughs> iPad and I have it with me all the time. It's currently at 20,000 words. So I think I'm okay for ideas at the moment. And it's all those little things that just pop up or snippets of conversation, as you say, something on the news. And I think it's writer's brain is always asking the question, what if? Yeah. And I think yeah. that's where, where yeah. this came from. And um, for this idea, I used to, um, I've worked in offices for years and I had a really great relationship with one guy where he was a bit like a work husband, where we were very silly and we used to mess about. And we did used to prank each other. And it was that question, well, what if one day a prank went too far? What would you do? What would you do if you thought you'd won 10 million on the lottery and you walked away from everything and then found out it was just a joke? It's, um, so it was, that's, kind of where, where, that's kind of where that, um, where that came from. But it's, oh, I, love uh, it. I, think, I, think, I think probably what editors, I'm sure there's quite a lot of editors pop up on the thing. And hello yeah. to Sabo as well. Sabo, we miss you. We love you. We do miss you, Sabo. Um, so an editor would probably say it needs to have a commercial hook and I think this certainly for me is one of the first times I think I've written something where it does have a commercial hook and something that makes people go oh, what would I do in that situation what would I do if I just walked away from everything it's um and I think so going back to the original question and something from an editorial point of view they'd probably like you to write something that has a really strong commercial hook something that makes it stand out from other reads but you could still go and it needs to sit alongside these authors because it's similar to them but what's unique about it is this yeah <laughs> yeah you make it sound easy <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's not easy. Uh, I really really think you need to try and be yourself which is quite difficult and not be anybody else and that that's that's not always an easy thing to do because you, you, you know, we're always doubting, is this idea strong enough? Will people want to read my voice? My, but, but, but having confidence in that, I think, in, um, if you can possibly do it, that's what will make you stand out, your unique personality. But your it's voice. Quite, yeah, it's quite, people ask what a, a voice is, and that, you probably explain that better than me, Sue, but that, that will also help your writing stand out to an editor, I think, if the editors agree with me. <laughs> Well, they can't speak, so, can't speak so we just say what we want, can't we? That's right, yeah. I, well, I have said nice things about editors, haven't I? Um, yeah, what, one other thing I'd say um, about that is sometimes um, don't think of the most obvious idea. 
uh, when I did a lot of teaching creative writing, I used to give people an exercise where I look at a news story um, and then think about how somebody concerned but not in the news would feel. So if it's a politician caught with his or her pants down, how does the daughter feel about that? What's going to happen to her at school? And that can really be quite hooky, I think. Um, so Mick Arnold has sent us in. Hi, Mick. Um, have you ever had an idea for a story that made you go, OMG, then you weren't able to write it for some reason, but that you'd love to go back to at some point? Come on, confession time, ladies. Have you done that? Bella. No, not that I haven't written. So mm. I had probably, must have been about two years ago, I had an idea and these two characters pitch up. So my characters tend to come first and two characters pitched up fully formed and would not leave me alone. Um, but the story just isn't a Bella book. It's not a romance. But last year I did um, the Camp Nano, which I think is April. And I just thought, I've just got to write this book because I haven't got the headspace and these people won't leave me alone. So I just started writing it and I've written the whole book and it's now with my agent. And it's, it's sort of, a, it's a book club read. It's, I think, I think the official tag is cross-generational uplit. Um, wow. but it's, it's not a Bella book, but I, I had to get it out of my head. So it's, um, so it isn't what I didn't write, but it's a story that isn't what I'd usually write. But, um, and it's, it centers around a library. And the two characters are Tom, who's 16, and Maggie, who's 72, and into martial arts. <laughs> wow. She's interesting then. She's, I, I love her. Like you. I love her. Yeah, I can imagine. I, yeah. <laughs> old, old, older people uh, in books can be really entertaining, can't they? And, and really little kids as well. You mm -hmm. can make yeah. them the butt of a few jokes yeah. in a way. Um, Philippa, so have you done that? Have, is there a book you want to write and you can't because like it's about a member of your family or something like that? Well, yeah, but I can't even allude to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that happened in our village and that is the only thing I'm oh, going to Oh, I know, I know, and, I know. <laughs> yes, and never. I couldn't write it. So, and it would be, well, it might be a psychological thriller and I don't know how to write a psychological thriller. So I'm not going to write it, but I know, I know why she's saying that, yeah. Because the Bella and some of the other authors came to stay at my house. About this time last year, we had a book launch, didn't we? And um, they heard it, but <laughs> I'm not going to go any further than that. Well, how intriguing. You yes. Have, yeah. Mick yeah. says, you, you tease, Philippa. You'll have to get her at a party and buy her a big glass of wine, Mick. Um, <laughs> so I, I've made a mistake here and I can't get rid of the Q&A and some of the things are on uh, chat. So, um, I'm having a look at the, at the Do you chat. plan your books in great detail or do you let them evolve as you write? <laughs> now I know, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> let's listen to Bella. Yeah. Uh, just a little selection of the post-it notes that I have to hand at any one time. Um, I'm a huge plotter and planner, but um, in my defence, I'm a project manager by trade. So that's what I have done for my professional life. So it makes absolute sense to me to plan a novel out to the nth degree. And that's what I do. So I have character bios. I have, I will, if I'm doing a village, I will draw the village. I'll have a map. I go through the arc I go through of each character, I go through the three act structure. I usually take it down to chapter level, sometimes a little bit more granular, granular than that. And I plot it all out on post-it notes. So huge plotter, but that doesn't mean it's the right way to do. That means it's the right way for me <laughs> because it's comfortable for me because I like to know that I've thought it all through and then I can just sit down and my first draft is quite quick because I know exactly what I'm doing and when I'm doing it. So and I just write in a linear fashion. So it's, it makes absolute sense to me. <laughs> it looks slightly crazy to other people. Don't your characters ever object though? You know, when you're on chapter eight and they'll suddenly go, no, that doesn't happen in chapter nine, Bella, actually. They do, yeah, they do. They're annoying like that, aren't they? Yeah. It's, they tend to, I tend to have a really clear idea and then when I start plotting it out, then the changes will come. So that's probably when my main changes come. Often I don't have anything too 
massive but I do have characters that pitch up and I just think oh you need a much bigger part than you've got because you've there's just something about you when I've actually got to them and it's usually it's those bit characters isn't it it's those that were going to be a walk-on part and when they walk on they sort of go ta-da leave me <laughs> in the book so they tend to get a bigger role then so yeah that it, it does happen but and I then then obviously I keep a spreadsheet so I can go back and do <laughs> foreshadowing <laughs> if something changes feel ill now <laughs> How about you, Philippa? What's your work process? Ah, right. Well, I've got, I have, it, it's got a little more structured from the very first book I wrote where I hadn't got a clue apart from the beginning and the end. I've usually, I've got the beginning and the end and maybe a couple of turning points in the middle. But on the whole, um, this is the way I plot. I, I go at it and then I have a little, then I have a brainstorm and um, I don't know if you can see my writing. Was it two? It's just scroll. That's my brainstorming scroll. Mm, I do and that. I, sometimes, I, have, yeah. I usually have to scrap about ten thousand words. And um, with the book that's coming out in June, I can't. I can't say too much. But there was something I couldn't decide on, and I couldn't decide on it till very, very, very long way into the book. And I wrote to my editor and my agent. I said. Now, I'm going to do the pros and cons of this or this. And I wrote this long thing to them, like as if they were going to decide for me. And of course, no editor would do that. And they just, you know, I was sent back with, and eventually I realised what should happen. So, oh, don't let that fall on you, Sue. <laughs> so that's my... It's not very my, heavy. That's my plotting method. And I just couldn't see into the future. If it I did fall on me. Yeah, oh, dear. <laughs> I just no, couldn't, no, no. I couldn't see, in, if I plotted, I couldn't see, it's just that, I can only go so far and then it's just total blank and only by writing can I work out what might happen, yeah, I love, I love that too. Here's one of my ideas, Storms, <laughs> I, I don't do very well with a book, I can't find anything. So I just keep stapling things together. I agree, you can't find anything It's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes so, you don't uh, need to look. Excuse me while I... <laughs> sort your sign out. <laughs> right, okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm somewhere between the two of you. I call yeah. myself a composter. I like <laughs> to have a big heap of material to dig into. Um, uh, but I do like to have some major um, things that I know. Um, I like to know a lot of backstory. I really, my, I, I can't get on yeah. with characters born on page one. I need to know them from the day of their birth, pretty much. I need to know their conflicts. I need to know what they want. If I can, I make characters' conflicts conflict with one another. So if he gets his dream, she can't get hers. It moved. It, you're okay, but it was moving. Okay. <laughs> it's not it has. It has. It. It zips down on its own. Right <laughs> across all my fingers before. Usually, I get someone else to deal with it. Yeah. But it, wasn't, it wasn't appropriate today. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Um, Ellie Pilcher says, "I love books set in and around libraries." Anybody done that? Oh, I, I think that's probably referenced my my. Um, my non-Bella book that I've written. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. <laughs> yeah, and it says, Sue, Sue creates some amazing maps for her books. Go on then. <laughs> My book of maps. Is this, of your oh, wow. is this of your places? Pardon? Is this of, of Middle Dip? Yeah, that's Middle Dip. Yeah. But like Tolkien has Middle Earth. Uh, yeah. Middle Dip. <laughs> And I and I have um, what? Where is that? That's my place in Italy, Monte Libertar. Um, and next next year's book's going to be set in Monte Libertar, so I don't have to remember. It's all written down. Mine's in my mind palace, like in Sherlock. <laughs> I do have it in my mind as well. I actually brought back for for this book. I actually brought back um, a youth centre I'd had in a backlist title, yeah. and I had to refresh my mind with characters. But the actual premises, I even yeah. remembered what the tiles were like yeah. on the floor, yeah. stuff like that. It, it's all in there. Yeah. Let's see if we've got, what time is it anyway? Hang on. 10 past oh, six. All right, oh. 20 minutes. 
Um, all Sabah says we're all doing a great job. Hi Sabah, we miss you. Sabah, for anyone who doesn't know, is head of PR at Avon. Um, have we got any more? Um, no, I think, have we got any more? Mika? Oh yes, yeah. Sabah says, who is the author you'd love to get a review quote from? Now that's a publicist question. Bella, who would you love to get a review <laughs> quote from? So, so what, what Sabah means is like on the front of a book, if, if people aren't aware, like, um, you know, somebody to say yeah. how wonderful you are. So uh, Bella. Mine would always be Jill Mansell. I love Jill Mansell. I'm a huge Jill Mansell fan. I've read everything she's written. And I wait patiently for her books to come out. And usually I take them a holiday with me, which is quite hard because I often have to wait and to take it and not not read it but obviously now I have a huge excuse because I'm not going on holiday so I can read it <laughs> whenever I like. <laughs> that's, I would, that's true. I would love to have a quote from Jill Mansell because um, yeah I just think she's she's amazing. Well Sabah's probably writing to her now except she's furloughed so she's not allowed to. So <laughs> how about you Philippa? Well I actually have got a quote from Jill Mansell on one of my previous <laughs> ones. Not um, <laughs> Eat your heart I've been out, very Bella. lucky. I've got one from Katie Ford on previous, and Miranda Dickinson, who is absolutely wonderful, has given me a quote for this one. I actually got someone who I'm reading some books at the moment by someone who doesn't write romance, and I'm absolutely astounded by these wonderful books. And she did offer, sort of, to read my current book. Everybody will kill me now from Avon. And I was too embarrassed to kind of take the hint further and say, well, yes. But um, yeah, so that, that person would be cool, but um, we'll see. <laughs> it's not, she doesn't write romance, but um, I'm always astounded when authors take the time to read mm -hmm. my books because I know they are absolutely bombarded with books through the door and requests. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always just so grateful and so amazed that they take the time to read them. I think getting the right fit is a thing as well, isn't it? Because you've probably been asked yourself, I'm sure you've been asked yourself, and, you know, somebody maybe asks you and they're a YA author and, you yeah. you know, it's it's not a good fit. They're, it's a waste of time, really, because yeah. their publisher is going to say, but the idea of having this on the front of your book is that people who like 